Your trailer is the most compelling pitch for your show. It's actually the thing you should spend a lot of time on. If this one minute version of the show is not compelling, it probably means the rest of the show is not compelling. Messaging and copywriting is hard, but by virtue of me sitting down and creating this, now every time I'm talking about the podcast online, in person, at a conference, I know how to talk about it in a concise way. And it's all stemmed from that one time that I sat down, I spent some time on it, I focused and I got it right. Welcome to another podcast roast where in every episode we dissect a listener show's packaging and so their cover art, their title, their description, and their episode titles to try and identify some takeaways that you can apply to your own show to help improve your discoverability and your listener acquisition. And uh, today on The Skewer, we have the show Primary Technology, uh, which was submitted by our listener Stephen Robles. Is that pronunciation right? I believe you you know, you know Stephen? I've been... I've been calling him Stephen Robles forever, but I think it's actually pronounced Robles. Okay. So, Stephen, you're going to have to uh, call into our voicemail line in the show notes and pronounce your name correctly, but I think it's Robles. Okay. And also, uh, follow up with that, your co-host, Jason Aiton. Uh, we, we could also use some <laughs> clarification on that pronunciation <laughs> as well. But Stephen and Jason <laughs> are the hosts of Primary Technology and uh, this is, I believe, a fairly new show, and it's one that I understand, Justin, you are actually a subscriber to. So you have some broader mm -hmm. context than just the packaging here. So this will be a little bit interesting to get your more educated view of the show and my totally clueless coming to this for the first time opinion. So uh, fill us in on a bit of the backstory. Yeah, Stephen and I met at Podcast Movement. We've become friends, and I'm a subscriber to this show. So I'm a bit biased on this one. I think we should start with your takes on it, but then I have an insight, something that Steven's done really well that I think is applicable to many other shows. But I think we should start with you. What are some of your thoughts on the cover art title and description on this one? Okay, so uh, the first thing that I see here, this is actually the first roast that we've done, and I have not actually seen many shows at all that are paid. There's a paid subscription option here. So that's one of the first things that, that jumps to mind. In Apple Podcasts, we see that. Uh, I'm assuming that in many other podcasting platforms, we're not going to see that. Uh, I don't know if they are doing this as well in Spotify. We can actually uh, pull them up here. It does not look like they have a paid uh, subscription on Spotify, although I'm not as familiar with uh, Spotify's UI uh, when it comes to the paid subscriptions, but we can see in Apple, there is that option. So that's the first thing that jumps out uh, to me is $6.99 a month or $69.99 a year. And I would say that that jumps out kind of for that reason that I haven't really seen this a lot. So that's already an interesting signal, perhaps that like, okay, there is another tier to this and that might shape mm -hmm. you know, my experience as a listener with the show to some extent. A few other things that are only noticeable in the app. They have custom side-to-side -side cover art that's just built for Apple Podcasts. You would only mm. notice this in the app. And you can only get that if you submit it to Apple's podcast editorial board to get that custom artwork. It's uh, you know full width, looks really great. And the other thing that a lot of folks want is they actually have real host and guest mm. uh, credits in Apple Podcasts, which again, you have to submit, you have to ask Apple's editorial team to do that for you. So I think a lot of folks would get an impression from the show that they are a different tier. How did they get their host and guest credits in the app? How did they get this custom uh, artwork in the app? They're doing something there that is different than you know, just a regular podcast. Yeah, and uh, I think maybe we'll we'll tease this for now, but I know that there are some uh, maybe networking kind of connections that they may have that may have made this easier. So we'll we'll put a pin in that for now, and maybe come back to that later. Continuing with my impressions of the show here, I see the the cover art primary technology. It feels very tech forward. I get the sense, obviously, from the name, technology is the biggest, takes up the kind of most space in the cover art, and so I'm like. Okay, this is a tech show. Uh, we've got the the host names mm -hmm. that are are pretty small here. I really like this, and even some of the graphics on the cover art for for everybody listening to the audio version. There's this kind of like blue green northern lightsy kind of like background gradient going on. It kind of goes from dark blue in the top left corner to a kind of magenta in the bottom right, and then we've got these kind of two corners uh, pieces that are kind of just these white corners kind of framing the bottom left and the top right corner. So it's kind of these arrows pointing in the, the opposite direction to some extent uh, from bottom left to uh, top right, uh, which I wonder if there's some 
connotation of like software company growth, progress, something like that comes to mind when I, I look at that, I think it'd be, you know, up and to the right type idea. So uh, that may be intentional. It may not be something that I'm kind of reading into this as a, a listener who is, you know, somewhat familiar with the tech space. So that's my kind of first impression of the cover art. Uh, is there anything else you want to highlight uh, from your experience with the show or looking through it again now? This is what I teased before. This is a great example of, in this case, I came for the host. Mm. And Stephen Robles has developed relationships, connections. He was the former host of the Apple Insider podcast. He developed a fan base there. If you scroll down, and you'll see there are uh, reviews from people who are saying, I loved Stephen on Apple Insider. I missed seeing him there. I came over so that I could listen to him on this show. And so in this case, he has built a name for himself and his name on the cover art and in the author tag in the byline matters a lot because in his case, it has cachet. Mm -hmm. He has built a name for himself in the space. He wisely attached himself to a popular Apple technology show. And he's also been making lots of YouTube videos. He is going to podcast movement. He's meeting people. I met him there. Like I said, I became a fan there after having met him. This is a part of marketing that we often don't talk about. And it shows the power of a name. I'm coming for the host. And so when I saw this new show and it had his name on it, I was like, I'm there. Whatever it is, whatever it's about, I don't care. I'm coming for the host. And again, it's a, a little biased, but it, it actually shows you how a lot of shows gain traction. It's everything else you've done before I come to the packaging, to the show listing that matters. And I think Stephen has done a great job at that. Yeah. I think the other interesting thing building on that, and actually we'll just close the loop here on the other thing that I hinted at before, is that Stephen had a history with the Apple Insider podcast, probably has some connections at Apple, an easier way of getting in touch with people and saying, hey, can we get that, you know, custom artwork and uh, those those host photos there. So he has some of the connections that, you know, may be open to anyone to build, but he already has that from his previous work that he's now bringing into this new show that he's able to kind of communicate this different tier of quality or experience potentially from the outset. The one other thing based on what you just said about you in particular, at least coming for Steven, and it sounds like he's done a great job of networking and built up a reputation, but you don't see his face on the cover. And this is really mm. interesting to me. And I think that this suggests that Steven and his co-host have greater ambitions than to just serve their existing audience, that they want to create a show that sends the signal that this is not about the hosts. This is about the content and the topic. And I think that that's mm. an interesting decision, especially when your name and potentially your face already has some cachet to intentionally not use that uh, is an interesting signal as well. That is not obvious to anybody who doesn't know him already, but I think that it acts as one fewer barrier to somebody who's interested in the topic and who's not coming for the host to actually look more closely into the show for the first time. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I said, I'm very curious about your reaction to this because I'm completely biased. Uh, when it comes to this particular show. So I'm, I'm just here to listen and learn uh, as, you, as you walk through some of these things. Okay, so the next thing uh, on the list here, we've got the title. So I am assuming this is another interesting situation. We've got the, just the title is Primary Technology. Uh, and that shows up on the cover art and it shows up as the, the title field. There's no additional keywords, no description. And my first impression is I don't really know what the show is about. And so I know it's about tech. I don't really know what primary means. And there's, you know, some connotations that might come along with primary, you know, being the first, the best, something along those lines. I'm not really sure at this point what that might be. One of the things that I will highlight is that if he had a subtitle or descriptive phrase after this, it would cheapen my impression of the show specifically because there is the paid subscription. If there wasn't a paid subscription, mm -hmm. I would care less. But for some reason, it elevates the brand. I'm like, ooh, there's this bold statement that they are going to have just this title. They also have this paid subscription. They also have the custom artwork. They also have the host photos. And so everything about my experience here is like, ooh, this is an elevated brand. And they're playing a bit of a status game here to some extent, I think, which is in unison, everything is coming together that is a, a positive impression when for some other shows, it might not actually work. And so 
this is something that is very hard to nail and you need to have the credibility to do it. So that's my kind of thought with the title. It's not 100% clear other than that it's about technology. It's possible that looking at the author tags, if his name has cachet, now that's actually the thing where I'm like, oh, primary technology. Oh, and Stephen Robles. Now maybe that's the thing that draws me in. But I think as somebody who doesn't know anything, they're not giving me a ton to latch onto here. And so that would be what I would say. There's some potential for more discoverability. But also, I suspect here that they're playing the long-term brand game and they're not in it for short-term attention capturing right now. And they're thinking over the long term, we're going to suck people in through our other marketing activities. And this is going to be kind of a premier type brand that we're we're building. So that's my impression looking mm -hmm. at this through the lens of like a marketer and how I would think through what is clearly a intentional strategy. Yeah. And on Jason's side, he is a columnist and contributing editor for Inc. Magazine. Okay. Uh, so he also has his own profile in the industry, his own cachet, his own following. And again, people looking for, you know, oh, what's new from Jason? What's new from Steven? What are they doing next? This is very smart, taking two audiences that have been built up, two networks, and combining them. And again, maybe it'll only get them the initial traction that they needed, but that's part of what's happening here uh, is just the signaling like, here's two reasonably well-known people from the tech space who are coming together to make a show together. And I mean, obviously the topic matters, but you're coming to see Jason's perspective on this topic. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, continue down to the description. So this is interesting. The description uh, does not, it's not truncated at all in the Apple podcast desktop app. I'm not sure how it shows up in the mobile app here, but I can read the whole thing right here. We break down the biggest tech news of the week and why it matters from consumer devices to AI, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and more. Tune in every Thursday for new episodes, plus subscribe for an ad-free version of the show and bonus content each week. Is that display untruncated in the app as well, or do you need to expand it? Actually not. What's interesting with this fancy Apple artwork they have, it truncates basically after why it matters. Okay. So you only get the first line, and I think it's because that fancy full-width artwork is pushing everything down. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that description? I mean... Personally, I don't love it if the goal is communicating the value of the show itself. It really seems like based on, you know, now what I know from you is that this show is driven heavily by the hosts. And so mm -hmm. this may be part of their strategy that people are coming for us. Like one of the things that with this description, if I'm the host and I know that I have an audience and I know my co-host has an audience, I would put that in here. I would say, you know, veteran journalist Jason Otten mm -hmm. from Inc. Magazine and Stephen Robles from Apple Insider, whatever. Like, I would put those things in here because even then to somebody new, that signals like, oh, these are publications and or other podcasts that I, even if I haven't listened, I'm aware of to some extent. And that lends credibility to this new show. And I might even play into that, like team up to share their opposing viewpoints or something like like I might play into it a, a little mm. bit more there. But from a, a new potential listener who doesn't know them or the show or anything about it, this isn't giving me like a lot to really pull me in. I get what it's about, but I don't get any kind of differentiation here. And so that to me, I feel like there is opportunity there if part of their goal is expanding the listenership and the audience base from their existing networks. I agree. I think their description could be improved. I'd be testing out social proof. Like you mentioned, hey, we've got some pretty good credits. If you know us from this, if you've seen us here, uh, you may be familiar with our work. But even if someone isn't familiar with their name, they know Inc. Magazine and Apple Insider is also a, a massive publication. So Mentioning that, I think if they can, maybe they're, maybe they're not allowed to, but I think they could add more social proof. The thing about the description to me is it's very generic. Mm -hmm. It's like, why do I care? Yep. We break down the biggest tech news of the week. Okay. And why it matters. Uh, okay. It feels boring. So I think they could sharpen this up. I would test this out. What makes this show controversial? What makes this show unique? What makes this show different? What point of view does it have that distinguishes it from all of the other tech news shows? Give it to me right away, right at the beginning, like jolt me out of my seat. 
and make me sit up in my chair and say, oh, oh, okay, wow, oh, maybe I should check this out. So I agree. I think the description can actually be improved, feels generic, and doesn't leverage some of their strengths. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things, I like that you mentioned the point of view. And I think that that's really important because the phrase, we break down the biggest tech news of the week and why it matters. That is a value judgment there, why it matters. And so some things, depending on who you are, some things will matter to you more than others, and some things might not matter to you at all. And so I think that there needs to be some qualifier there of like, who is this for? Like, there's a lot of tech news. Tech is a massive industry. Of course, there's a lot of people who are just interested in technology as a whole. But I assume that there is something about their super fans or the people they want to attract more of, that they're in a specific segment of that audience, that those are the people that they should be clearly communicating to say like, hey, this is the absolute number one show for you. And we cover these topics from your perspective, essentially the same thing that matters for you. We distill this and we understand why these tech news updates matter to you. And we present it in that way. So without that, that line feels really generic. If you add that in, like why it matters to you as a whatever, or why it matters so mm -hmm. that you can this, that's where it becomes more specific. And I think it starts to latch into some kind of like hook in the, the listener. Yeah. And I think if you were going to write like an alternative to article, you see this all the time on the web, like alternatives to Canva. And then you have a list of alternative competing products. And often in those articles, they'll say, listen, if you're upset that Canva doesn't do this, this, and this, or you really want this, then you should come over to this show. And it feels like primary technology could benefit from that. Like if you're tired of tech news from mega corporations, here's a look from two independent thinkers or well, I don't yeah. know what, what would something like that I think you could write your alternative to description or pitch mm -hmm. and pull some people in that are looking for so, for an alternative to what else is out there yeah and so this is the concept of positioning kind of staking your claim to a part of the landscape within your niche that you can own and defend and often contrasting yourself against something else. And it's not that the other thing is bad. It's just that it's a different choice for people with different tastes. And so an example that I use of this a lot is like, if you're looking for a coffee mug, you could go buy one for a dollar at Ikea, or you could go to your local farmer's market and buy one probably for $50. And for some people, it's like, I just need something to drink out of. And so the Ikea mugs like the best possible mug, why would I spend $50 on a coffee mug? And other people are like, I want something that's one of a kind and it feels good in my hands and there's a memory attached to it. And so this is a way that you could position yourself. And Ikea is making a positioning choice on price and uh, accessibility. And the farmer's market artisan is saying, no, I'm putting some craft into this and my customers care more about this than they do. They actually don't want something that's cheap and potentially disposable and mass market. They want something that says something maybe about them. And so we all have some of the seeds of these things in our shows and our content. And one of the easiest ways to stand out and differentiate yourself is just to say, unlike other shows that all focus on this, only we really amplify this aspect of our, our topic here and really hone in on that. So something to, to think about with your show, what might that be? What do other shows do that you won't do? And what do you do that, that similarly other shows won't? Yeah. All right. So should we look at the uh, episode titles here a little bit? I'm scrolling through here and I see the first episode that comes up highlighted here in Spotify as they tend to highlight the most recent episode that was published. Google AI's failure, Apple car is over, AI powered Siri. So this to some extent is not great titling, but there's another perspective that given that this is in the category of news podcast, this actually makes perfect sense. And so I think with news, there's a different convention for titling where you want to see, I'm guessing, it's actually interesting. So the other thing I'm, I'm noticing here now is that the episodes, I was going to say, these might be quick hit episodes. These are actually hour and a half long episodes. So these are yeah. long episodes, but I think that in the news genre, it's less kind of copywriting-y and hooking you in. It's more telling you, here's what we talk about in this episode. And it's because there's a different job to be done. And really the job to be done here is being updated on what's happening in a potentially efficient manner to some extent and giving you the context. And so I think here, because they talk about many things in one episode, it actually wouldn't make sense to title it around just one topic. And this is actually something that I think a lot of podcasters fall into a trap where when you don't know where your episode is going at the start and you're just like, I'm going to have a guest on and we're going to see where it goes and talk about whatever, it becomes really hard to title it well. And it almost guarantees that it will become clickbait to some extent where you know, in your hour long episode, there's 10 minutes you dedicated to this thing, but that was like three quarters of the way through the episode. And you're like, well, that's the hookiest title. 
But somebody clicks into that episode, they will listen through 30 minutes and they're like, they still haven't talked about this at all. I'm leaving. And so I think with this, this is actually a smart move here is to say like, these are the things we discussed in this episode. And I think the other thing that works with this is because news, this is all very relevant. It's very timely. And so talking about Google's AI failure, Apple Car is over, AI powered Siri. These are things that I'm assuming anybody listening to the show is already plugged into the tech space. They've already heard about this stuff. And what they're coming here more for is context. And so this is actually what's getting them in the door. They heard about Google's uh, AI's failure. They heard about that the Apple car is over. Maybe they've even read a couple articles, but they want to come for the context that Steven and Jason provide. And so that would be my assumption of how this works. And so I think those that titling is actually perfectly fine for this show. Yeah, this is another example of where digging in to the listener context would matter quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I think one suggestion I would have for Stephen and Jason would be to do a listener survey and figure out what is the job to be done here. I listen to other shows like this. Another one is uh, Accidental Tech Podcast, mm. ATP. And the way I listen to that show is I scroll the episode titles and if something jumps out at me, like MacBook Pro review, oh, they finally reviewed the new MacBook Pro, I'm going to check that out. And they might cover a lot of topics, but I'm clicking through on the episode title to get, okay, I want to get their take on the new MacBook Pro reviews because I'm thinking about buying it. Um, you know, similar here with their podcast, they have uh, numerous episodes titled Apple Vision Pro. And if you're interested in that topic, it's like, should I get this? What's their take on this device? I'm going to click through and get their take on this particular topic. So I think these shows, my guess is these are very topic-based shows and the success of an episode will depend largely on how much momentum there is already. People searching for answers on that topic or searching for the take on that topic. And I'll bet their analytics go up and down based on what kind of existing pull from the listener already exists. Like the listeners are out there looking for information and trying to bring it to themselves about a particular topic. Yeah. So I think their titling makes sense and they could confirm this or they could investigate this further by doing a listener survey and getting the context for it. how do you listen to our episodes? What makes you choose one of our episodes to listen to? Just have a big text box in your survey software, let people write it out and start to get some of this, how people are coming to your show, how they're approaching new episodes, and I think that would even help them to come up with better topics. Like what topics should we be going after every episode that are really going to draw people in? Because the listener antenna is already out looking for, I want to hear more about this particular bit of tech news. Like what's the follow-up on that? Apple's car. Like what happened with that? Is that still a thing? Oh, here's an episode on Apple's car. I'm going to listen to it because it's an open question in my mind. Yeah. And I think like, you know, the other thing that they do a good job with the titling is they are using all the keywords. Google's AI failure. Pr probably people are talking about Google AI. That's what they're searching. Uh, if they've heard about the news, Apple car, AI powered Siri. These are all things they've got Google, Apple, AI in there twice uh, and then Siri. And so there's a lot of keywords in that title that people are already going to be searching for these topics. And now they've got three potential kind of surface areas uh, to come up with in search. So I think, yeah, that's it makes a lot of sense for this show. And they're kind of trying to tap into the stream of interest already. Other things that I'm seeing here are uh, in the description, they kind of just expand on the, what's in the title. So in this case, Google's AI failure, Apple Car is over AI powered Siri. Then the description reads, Apple pivots by killing the Apple Car project to focus on AI innovation. Google's controversial Gemini AI image results. Apple's potential new fitness wearables. Sonos rumored high-end headphones. And most importantly, our coffee habits. And so again, it's just kind of giving a little bit more context. That's almost like a typical newspaper headline in each of those. I think that's fine. I, again, I don't really think they're winning people over with their description here. I think it's like, oh, these are people who I like their opinion on and I agree with it and I respect it. And I want to hear what they have to say about this topic. And anybody who's coming for the first time, I think as well, you know, they're maybe just coming for like, I'm looking for some information on this thing. And oh, here's three things that I'm all interested in. It's like a, a dense kind of dosage almost of things that I've been meaning to research more about. And so I'm going to give this a shot. Yeah. I would also like to see 
a little bit of hacking here. I, I'm curious for this show if they got a bunch of their listeners and super fans, if they said, uh, hey, open up Spotify, search for Apple Vision, switch to the episode list. And if you could scroll down and find our episode, click through on it. We're just curious what happens when, you know, there's some momentum for people searching and then clicking through on these episode titles. Yep. There's uh, some kind of experimentation that might be worth doing there. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the custom episode artwork that I see they have here? I'm biased. I like it. Some of it is more compelling than others. Apple Vision goggles that jumped out at me. Yep. And it's like, okay, I'm going to get a big in-depth review on this topic here. And it, again, I recognize Steven in there. So if he's got some recognition, it might be worth doing that more. Yeah. What are your thoughts as an unbiased visitor here? Yeah, I think some of them, like you mentioned, are more compelling than others. And so I like there's this one here. Uh, so the episode title is Apple Vision Pro pre-orders Samsung Galaxy uh, S24 unpacked. And then in quotes, I can hear your face scan. And so the custom artwork here is the, it looks like the, I don't know if that's a box of the Apple Vision Pro. And so it's like, you get the sense of like, oh, this is going to be like an unboxing type thing. And so I think that gives me more information here about what this is about. I like this one that's above that. The veil of utopia. The Mac is 40. Microsoft is $3 trillion and iOS 17.3 makes it harder to steal your iPhone. That has this really classic, is this is this a Mac computer or one of the really early ones here? Mm -hmm. Super old school. And so you're like, yeah. oh, that's kind of interesting just because it's so unique kind of an image. You don't really see these old Macs uh, like this one anymore. And it, for everybody listening on audio, your vision of like the old Macs, this is probably older than what you're thinking of right now. And so mm -hmm. I, it's like the original Macintosh. Yeah. So those I think are good. I think some of these other ones are a tad generic a little bit i'm not quite sure like one there's the one here that feels a bit it's got an apple vision pro a woman wearing it that feels a bit stock photo-y it's probably actually from apple's marketing materials but that one it feels generic there's another one below that another apple vision pro again feels like a marketing material or stock photo i don't love that one either um i think like we've talked about in previous episodes of these roasts i want to see the cover art add something to the title uh, offer some additional yes. tension or contrast or information that I didn't get from the title. And so that's something that isn't really happening in all of these. It might be already saying the same thing that the title's saying. And so it's just like, well, okay, whatever. It's just neutral at that point. Yeah. I And I think these could benefit with some of that tension we've talked about before, especially in the thumbnails you're making, where there's one or two words on the thumbnail that is creating some tension with the title. Yeah. Right? So, you know, if you're going to have Apple Vision Pro, ultimate consumption device, you could add one or two words like not great, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So two words that are instantly kind of evoking some feelings and like, oh, the, there's a point of view here. Yeah. Oh, a little saucy. The cover art is almost like the saucy response <laughs> to the episode title and description. If you're going to make a generic title and description, make your episode cover art saucy. Yeah, and I think you can do that vice versa as well. And so you can have a really angelic cover art there and then you can have a saucy title or something like that. The one resource that I'll shout out for people, uh, my friend Jake Thomas has a newsletter called Creator Hooks. And essentially what he does every newsletter, he breaks down YouTube titles and cover arts at the combination and he explains why it works and how you can kind of take that formula and apply it to yourself. So super great free newsletter. And if you're looking to get more down the rabbit hole in terms of both great titles. He, he focuses on YouTube in particular, but I think there's a lot that podcasters can take away from titling in YouTube as well as the, the thumbnails that go with them. There are a little bit of different kind of uh, different platform conventions between titling on YouTube and podcasting that I, I would be aware of to some extent, but I think there's a lot of good inspiration there. So uh, Creator Hooks, check it out, and there's will help you up your game in that regard. Yeah, and search for these topics in Apple Podcasts and in Spotify and see what jumps out at you. That's part of the game. And if you're at a conference and your listeners are there, have them scroll through some episodes from your competitors and say, quick scroll, just tell me when something jumps out at you. And it's like, oh, what about that one? Oh, why did that jump out at you? Oh, wow, it's like they're bringing up this topic I've been thinking about. They're going to tell you, which is much different than bringing someone some cover art and going, what do you think of this? And they, they'll say, oh, it's fine, you know? Yeah but actually testing it out by doing a scroll test live with somebody. Hey, just let me know when something jumps out at you that you think you would click on 
and then ask, oh, why, why was that, do you think? Explain your thought process there. And it, it's probably one or two things that jumped out at them and they're like, oh, this is the one. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple things before we kind of wrap this one up here. I do notice they have a trailer episode. I also noticed that it's 41 seconds long, which is good in some ways in that it's short. It's a really low bar to like listen to it. But I almost suspect that it might suffer from the same issue as the description where how much useful information can they communicate to me in 41 seconds about their differentiators and why I should choose their show versus another. 41 seconds is more time than it would take to read just their short description here. But I do wonder if maybe they added, you know, doubled that length as a minute and a half, two minutes, and they could make a stronger case for what makes this show worth listening to versus another technology show. Granted, I have not listened to this. So maybe they are have a masterful 41 seconds here. That is the perfect pitch of the show. But based on my kind of initial impression here, I'm thinking like, okay, how much is in that? It's probably a, just a quick read that is similar to the description. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to see the trailer. I think, again, it's really important. Just make sure that your trailer is the most compelling pitch you've been able to produce for your show. And the way people generally create their trailer is like as an afterthought, and they're just rushing to put it together. Where is it? It's actually the thing you should spend a lot of time on at the beginning, because you're just going to do it maybe once or twice in the history of your show. And this is the pitch. This is what is supposed to draw a potential listener in. So make it the best version of a trailer that you can produce. Make it compelling. And then you can also have it as a, you know, a YouTube video. You can have it as a pinned tweet. You can have it as an Instagram reel. Like repurpose it, but make sure that that thing is the best version, the best pitch for your show. Yeah. And I think we've talked about this before too, with the description and the trailer, they tend to get relegated to these like last things on the checklist before launching your show or whatever. But I think that that's fine in some cases, but I would come back to revisit them. And what I like about your kind of framing here is you can, regardless of how many downloads your trailer ever gets, and you, you can use this and repurpose it in a lot of ways, but I would treat it as a forcing function to hone the pitch. And so it's like, okay, this is my chance to sit down and bang my head against the wall a little bit because messaging and copywriting is hard and it is for everyone. And I'm going to just approach this seriously. And I'm going to spend a few hours writing a script that is my most concise pitch. And maybe the trailer gets a few hundred downloads over the course of the lifetime. But by virtue of me sitting down and creating this, now every time I'm talking about the podcast online, in person, at a conference, I know how to talk about it in a concise way because I've written it out, I've scripted it, I've recorded it. And so now that pitch is going to be used everywhere. And it's all kind of stemmed from that one time that I sat down, I spent some time on it, I focused and I, I got it right. Yeah. And it can lead to a sort of existential crisis <laughs> because often what happens is when you do sit down to do that work, you may realize I actually don't have a compelling pitch for this show. Mm -hmm. the, the topic, the way I've crafted it is not compelling enough. And it might bring you back to the drawing board to say, what things am I going to build into this show? What unique point of view, what take, what tension am I going to introduce to make this not generic? Yes. And I understand why people don't want to do it because it's almost like this is going to make me reevaluate the whole show. But maybe that's the best thing you could do for your show is to have a little pain of, ah, if this one minute version of the show is not compelling, it, it probably means the rest of the show is not compelling if we can't make this one minute version attractive to a potential listener. So embrace the pain, go through the process, and then let that inform what you do with the show and the concept for the show. Yeah, whenever I work with somebody on concept creation and differentiation, oftentimes the messaging is kind of tied in with that. And so tends to to happen almost every single time. It's happened for me whenever I develop anything and most of the people that I work with where there's this push and pull where you'll, you'll go through some kind of show concepting exercises and you'll start pulling it together and you get stuck at some point or it's like, okay, but it's not great. And then you go to the messaging and you're like, okay, well, I, I've got, you know, it's good enough here. Maybe I'm going to try and start talking about it. And sometimes putting language to what you're doing actually unlocks and you realize you come up with a statement, the sentence that you're like, okay, this is a show about technology where in every episode we do X, Y, Z. And you're like, oh, 
that's not the show I've created, but that's really interesting. And it is much easier to create a compelling sentence or description of a show than it is to flesh out that show fully. And sometimes there are things where it's like, you can create a interesting pitch for a show that would be impossible for you to create. And it's like, okay, that's a good show concept, not one that I can create. Yeah. But I think that sometimes going through the messaging, coming up with pitches and just saying like, okay, a show about technology where in every episode we, and then you fill in the blank and you just come up mm -hmm. with 20 versions of that. And you find somewhere in there and you're like, oh, now that would actually be a really interesting show. And yeah. that's not what I'm creating so far, but I could create that. And that would be much more attractive than what I've currently got here. Oh, I love this as an exercise because this allows you to practice some of this mm -hmm. and even just imagining potential shows, like just come up with keywords. That's fun. Yeah. And this is, I think this is something that once you start to exercise that muscle, you your ability to come up with future show ideas and also like hone maybe you generally like the topic that you're on but i think a lot of times most people don't find their way into their perfect version of their show for for quite a while often months or even years and eventually it clicks and you're like oh this this was the the seed of this show was always here and i couldn't really see it before and now that i see it sometimes you, you reinvent the show you relaunch it whatever a lot of times you just say okay i'm just pivoting to this now we're keeping the show everything we're adopting a new format and I think if you can start to notice great show concepts out in the wild and what makes them interesting, and you start to just practice this and say, a show about whatever topic. So one of the ones that I have on my mind that I've had for years, I would really love to listen to a show that explored the kind of geographic reasons why certain kind of major cities of the world and civilizations emerged where they did. And so we think about like, why did London become the city that it is? Like, what about the geography of where it is? Like, and I've wondered that when I've gone to London, I'm like, it's not a coastal city, but it's on it's on the river. So it's got sea access. But like, how did it become this global seat of an empire when usually you think of like, oh, it would be a, a port town where it's like right on the coast and there's easy shipping and all these things. And then you start to think about other cities. I think Portland is another city like that in Oregon, where I'm like, it's up the mm -hmm. river. It's not right on the coast, but it's so close to the coast where a lot of times major cities are, are coastal. And so this was a question that just got into my mind of like, what's going on there? How did this happen? And somebody who created a history podcast looking at the weather patterns and migration of people and like the geographic kind of features of the area. I think that's a fascinating concept that I've never heard anyone talk about, but there's something there to dig into. Yeah. Before we sign off here on, on this show, I would love to know as a listener, you've mentioned that Stephen brought you in and I'm guessing that Stephen is what keeps you coming back. But from somebody who's listened to the show, we've looked at some of the, the kind of first impressions from the show here. What do you think this show does really well from a kind of content production standpoint that keeps you coming back as a listener week after week? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is the dynamic between him and Jason. Mm -hmm. I think uh, they have different perspectives. Sometimes Jason is a little more critical than Steven. So I like their dynamic. Honestly, sometimes you're just looking for the newest freshest version of a genre. Yeah. And like I said, I've been listening to, you know, in the early days, I listened to the CNET podcast a lot, but that just feels kind of old and crufty to me now. And so just getting the freshest version of this show feels like, oh, okay, this is like younger people doing this brand new concept, fresh eyes. I, I kind of like that feel. And yeah, a lot of it has to do with just like them answering the questions that I have in my head, like what happened to that Apple car concept? Is that going through and uh, having them address it and give their take on it? A lot of it is just I, the hosts. Yeah. I'm there for their dynamic, their voice, their opinion, their point of view. Yeah. And so, you know, that to me, if we're thinking about kind of key takeaways here, I think it sounds like they've got a great product. And so this is obviously the foundation of a marketable show. And so once you get people in, it sounds like there's a good dynamic between the hosts. They cover uh, relevant topics. All They're doing all the right things there. But I think from the outside, I would want to highlight some of that more. And so you mentioned there are some differences in opinion. Some of these things, that's what I would want to highlight in the show description and some of the other show packaging here. And so you maybe think more about like, okay, one's like a minimalist and one's a maximalist when it comes to tech or whatever it is. And that, like, that's the tension that you're like, oh, we're going to get different perspective. It's not just a big fan club here. And if I'm somebody who... I'm using the show to help me come to my own conclusions about things. I actually, that's what I want. I want to hear this extreme and I want to hear the other extreme on the opposite side of it. And so maybe that's not the whole dynamic of the show, but it sounds like that's a seed of it in there. And I would want to highlight that in the description to be able to give people a sense of the specific experience that they're going to get related to tech when it comes to listening to this show. Yeah, that's good advice. I think if they were going to improve something, it's to like bring more of that into the description. And I, I didn't listen to the trailer, but 
if that's not in the trailer, bring that in. Introduce some of these tensions. And sometimes you need a few episodes to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But once you've figured out the dynamics of the show, highlight those. It's like, oh, yeah, and maybe your listeners are telling you like, oh, Jason's a little more grumpy than Steven, you know? Like, okay, let's let's have grumpy Jason versus optimistic Steven, you know? Like, let's put that into our marketing. And that can be attractive to a listener who's like looking for something. Uh, people like that tension. They're often looking for good cop, bad cop, yeah. you know? So there's some of these well-worn tropes that we can reuse on our shows. Just examine the greats, examine what, other types of media have done and introduce that into your show and your show's packaging. Yeah. So I think uh, that wraps it up for, for this roast. If anybody else uh, who is listening to this is looking to submit your show to the skewer, uh, you can search our show podcast marketing trends explained in Apple podcasts, and you can leave a rating and review. And in that review, make sure to include the name of your podcast and, uh, if we pull your name from that hat, uh, you will be next up on The Skewer in a future episode.